Welcome to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Lucas Oil, TireRack.com, and RockAuto.com. Here's your Motor Week podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to Motor Week podcast number 285. And with us today are Greg Carlos, Jessica Ray, and Alex Kellum. But before we get into the vehicles and the lightning round and the viewer question and the rant and raves we have planned today, this is our first podcast that you're hearing at the start of our 42nd season of Motor Week. Mm -hmm. 42 years providing, we hope, the best unbiased automotive information you can find. And we have huge news for the beginning of our 42nd season. First of all, most folks out there that are aware of Motor Week and listen to the podcast and, and watch the show know that we lost Pat Goss this past uh, spring. And we have been working very hard on what we do to keep car care a part of Motor Week. So we're inaugurating a new series of, of features we're calling them Your Drive. Uh, this will be, I guess, replacing Goss's Garage, although many of us, it will always continuing, be Goss's Garage. Continuing. Continuing in the vein that Pat Goss set down, which was basically the best car care you can find in any media. Mm -hmm. And we're delighted because it gives us a chance to do something a little different. We recognized up front they're trying to find another Pat Goss is pretty much impossible. Yeah. So we have branched out and we have a trio of new hosts for your drive. And they include Audra Forden, who is the founder and CEO of Women Ought to Know. She's out of Flushing, New York. She has a large garage up there. And she's more or less a generalist and will cover a lot of the topics that Pat might have covered. Logan McCombs comes from Hagerstown, Maryland, and he basically is really just the guy when it comes to structure, engine tuning, mm -hmm. tuning, suspension fabrication. I think you're going to get a lot of information out of him. And something truly different for us, Daniel Maffitt. Daniel comes from Middletown, Delaware, and Daniel is a car designer. He basically is a customizer, and he's going to spend a lot of time talking about what you can do to make your, your ride really special and stand out from everyone else. And in addition to that, we're starting a new, a new way of looking at the automotive world for Motor Week. We're calling it Destination Zero. And it's basically looking at the first 100 plus years of the automobile and what it has done to the environment and what people can do to make sure when it comes to recycling, uh, oil, or just using uh, reconditioned and remanufactured parts, what you can do to lessen the effects of the automobile on the environment. And you will see that throughout the course of our 42nd season. And it's new topics that we've never done before, mm -hmm. new graphics. All the way around, it's it's what we would probably call in the auto industry a a revamping, refresh, refreshing, a little refresh. refresh. Not totally all new, yeah. but an awful lot new is happening with Motor Week season 42. Anybody else want to add anything there? Uh. Yeah, we're still keeping a lot of familiar things around, though. Obviously, Including you, Greg. Protests. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. This is my 10th year. Wow. Week, well, I'll be doing he was just a baby. Still over the edge. Uh, actually, John, you and I just got back from a fun shoot at uh, Tire Rack. Got to drive around their test track, so that'll be fun. Well, more than that, you got to be an official Tire Rack tire tester for a day. This is a segment, Tire Rack, that we've wanted to do with those folks for a long time because nobody in the industry test tires like they do. And, and that is all they do in their testing facility. It's not an adjunct to actually doing vehicle tests. And it was very interesting to see what they do. And they put you through the ringer, both wet and dry. And uh, it was a great shoot. Yeah, and most importantly, I didn't make a fool of myself <laughs> driving. So that's no, always good when you very yeah, confident. Yeah, when you can impress the uh, tire testers. Now, getting there and getting back yeah, was something uh, else yeah. again, because we, we all got we stuck in, in all of that mayhem and, and, and delayed flights that everybody has talked about all summer long. And it's true. It's not just headlines uh, on mm -hmm. the news uh, uh, every night. Anyway, uh, that's coming up. Probably will be, or it will be, in one of our October episodes. 
So let us get down to business. Uh, we're going to be discussing BMW's first all-electric sedan, and we've got some big reveals from one of the Detroit brands that we'll get to at the end of our podcast. But let's start at, out with um, the 2022 BMW i4. Jessica, why don't you take the lead on this really first successor true all EV successor to the three series style sport sedan. Go. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's built on like the same platform as the the new four series that we've that we've recently. Which is seen. pretty amazing, actually, that it is. Yes, yeah. uh, specifically too because of like the range numbers that this mm. is able to get. This these are what I would consider normal ranges, um, which obviously makes sense that BMW must have been preparing for this right. for quite some time. Um, but basically, like exterior-wise, when you look at the the i4 compared to a normal 4 Series, we actually had them in at the same time. They are very similar. Very similar. I mean, really, if you didn't, if you did, if it wasn't for the, essentially the blocked off grill in the front, I'm not sure most people coming down the street would even notice. No, I mean, it's just slightly more angular than um, the, its gas uh, uh, sibling. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it looks, and I, there's something about it though, that like, and maybe it's just like the angles and it's just a little sharper that I think it looks better than the War series. I don't know mm. why. And maybe it's because of like the grill, um, which I know we've kind of right. like talked about to death already, yeah. um, but there's just something about it. Like it, it's just just a little sharper that well, I really if, like its exterior. If you were in their design team, that's exactly what you would want. You don't yeah. want it to scream "I'm an EV" because right. we've done that, been there, done that, and we all know that they've got another all electric that does that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at the same time, you want it to look just a little bit more premium mm -hmm. than the uh, the ICE engine vehicle. I'm, and it's such. I think it's so so smart because uh, it, it is so subtle. I mean, you take a look at say the IX, which uh, compared to a five series uh, next five. Yes, they're starkly different. Mm -hmm. Starkly different. This is this is not the same. Anyway, so you have a bunch of different options. There's a single a single motor um, option that'll get you 301 miles of range uh, with 335 horsepower. Uh, there's all wheel drive will push you down to 270 miles of range. Um, but adding the which all wheel drive adding the extra motor with right. that. And, and it's, then it's rear drive to start with. Correct. Very and important. then there's also should be the uh, and I don't know if that's the base base model. There's like two rear. I believe there's like yeah, two rear drive. There's going to be another out, base yeah. model that's yeah. going to be out. Right. And um, so look for that one. We don't know the specs on that quite yet. But um, and then so we had the M50, which uh, actually is only supposed to get 227 miles of range, and it's got four, 536 horsepower. Now we were able to just kind of eke out potentially 243 mm -hmm. miles on that. Um, which is which is good. I mean, this is a high performance model, um, so being able to beat that range uh, is good. But 227 miles—that's that's not a lot. No, and it, and it bring you know when you start getting under 250, I think you're you're back to the point where you're not truly competitive with some of the things that have already been out there. But you know, it's right. going to depend on how people drive, and, and, and probably the reason we got to 240. Was probably somebody wasn't on the interstate that much. Maybe. Yeah. But and and so pricing for like that M50, you're looking at like sixty eight thousand dollars, closer to, close to seventy yeah. grand. I mean, you look at that compared to say like I don't know, you wanted to get a a, a Tesla a of some sort, three. you yeah. know, a performance model. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you would be getting more range in that aspect. But it's a BMW. Like yeah. this is this is a little bit different. Now when you Inside is like starkly BMW as well. It pretty much was very, very similar. Very driver centric, very familiar. Yes. The biggest difference in this compared to a typical 4 Series is that it has uh, this the new large singular display that BMW is working with these days. Um, so it's very big and it works with the, their new software iDrive 8, which um, I have like a love hate relationship with a little bit. I wasn't super impressed with it, but it was very clean and modern, and um, 
I think if you spend a lot of time in it, you would get used to it. Um, right. Let's have a little discussion, though. It's a BMW. Mm -hmm. It's the heir apparent to the legendary 3 Series. It's a five-door, but still, mm -hmm. it's what it is. What does it drive like? Does it have any of that BMW sensation when you drive it? I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> right there. Um, because I actually spent um, a smaller amount of time in the i4 than I did in the iX SUV. And, um, you know, it's interesting because in the iX, and this is purely subjective, I didn't feel like the BMW drive experience was um, as prominent in mm -hmm. that as it is in other BMW SUVs. I just, I didn't get that same ultimate driving experience mm -hmm. feel in the iX. When I got in the i4, I did. So you can't say it's necessarily the electrification that's taking mm -hmm. it away, because like I said, you have an all electric i4, which does have a traditional, in my, in my experience, uh, BMW drive and the iX, the SUV, also electrified, fully electric, does not. So it's something, I don't know what happened between the i4 and the iX where you get it in the, the traditional BMW drive in the i4 and different, not the iX. Different customers maybe. And, yeah. and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah. I need to spend more time in the i4 to, uh, and the iX. But no, I, I, I agree just, with you 100%. I didn't, I, um, to be quite mm -hmm. honest, I did not really enjoy driving the iX like I did the i4. And that's not something I would usually say about a BMW SUV because traditionally they have driven like a BMW. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> but the i the the i4 had that I mean you've got a big battery it weighs a lot yeah. so mm -hmm. it's it's very stable we all know that it, all of them everything everything's get, like that. Everything you get in that 3 or 4 series you get in the i4 and the M50 is actually quicker than an M3. Yeah. So I mean Which you get the performance it's mm -hmm. not just like mm -hmm. yeah it's not just daily driving it's it's performance. A lot of it was you know we've complained in recent years about steering feel on BMWs how it's gotten lighter and vague. I actually thought that despite the fact that this is a purely electric unit they got some of that feel back. Mm. You know you actually it was it was weighted yeah. where the the iX was not was very light but the i4 was weighted and you actually felt like you were in command of something that the vehicle was responding directly to you. So it's very tough to put all of that, to find exactly why mechanically mm -hmm. that happens. But the tuning definitely is there. Agreed. Well, anyone else? Uh, no, I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with it, just with um, you know our schedule and my own personal schedule. But one thing that I he can... He lives on an airplane, by the yeah. way. <laughs> one thing I can compliment it on, uh, the acceleration to me. Uh, with some EVs, I've noticed that like you, know, you accelerate as quick and then it just fizzles out, tapers off. I didn't really get that with the i4. Uh, I felt like it kept wanting to go, and that was pleasant. That was nice. But yeah, I didn't get to spend too much time in it, unfortunately. So, Any uh, comments? No, uh, I mean, I agree. I yeah. agree with the both of you, because I've spent time in, in, in both vehicles. and, yeah. and that, So I do think maybe it might be a consumer reason why there is this yeah. difference, because, you know, especially who uh, brands are marketing sedans to these days, right? Like more enthusiast. It's almost like a sedan is more like, enthusiast well, car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I had to guess, maybe the iX being a technical new model, whereas the i4 being based off a of four series, right? They had to stick with a tr like they had a benchmark for the f i4. They knew people were going to compare the them to it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But great report. Now, I mentioned we were going to save um, uh, some of our Detroit news to the end, but actually we're going to split that up into two pieces, and I'm going to go to Alex next. All right. This is the return of the Dodge Hornet 2023, although it's a very different Hornet than the last one. <laughs> yes. Take it away. Yes. So Dodge Hornet 2023, not quite a Hudson, not an AMC. It is the new Dodge Hornet. So it's a five-seater compact SUV, and it is going to be – two models when it well basically we're gonna have a gt and an rt the rt is a plug-in hybrid electric which i mm. think is dodge's first uh, plug-in hybrid yeesh. well there's been the minivan okay well, well dodge but dodge, dodge didn't brand yeah but dodge yeah. didn't have that that was a correct it was chrysler yeah, just chrysler yeah. Right. so yeah it's uh, yeah. cousin vehicle is the Alfa Romeo Tonale. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is familiar with that, uh, essentially, uh, dimensionally, it's it's basically the same. If you want to compare it to other vehicles you can get right now, it's 
a little bit bigger than like a Jeep Compass, a mm. little bit smaller than a Cherokee, but it's it, it slots in around there, uh, basically. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned, we're going to have a, a plug-in version and a non-plug-in version. The non-plug-in, which is the GT, uh, they're touting that as starting under $30,000. Uh, granted, I think that's going to be like right at 30 <laughs> that stuff, but that's, that's yeah. pretty affordable for, for Dodge's These current things. lineup. I mean, that I think to me, that's, that's a really smart move. This is the first new Dodge in quite a while. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thought, I mean, I know that there was an edict at Stellantis. Basically every brand has to prove its worth over the next couple of years or it's bye-bye. And so this mm-hmm. is the first salvo from Dodge to show we want to stick around and we're going to do things a little different than the other brands. Yeah, and I mean, it's an impressive one, especially considering the news with the Challenger and Charger. They needed to put something impressive out in the news. And I will get to that in a minute. Yeah, I will say the the Hornet's a pretty solid one. All-wheel drive is standard on both of them, which is also pretty good to hear. Mm. Uh, So with the, I'll just go to the RT because that one's a little more interesting to me. It's a 1.3 liter turbo four. Tiny. Yes, Mm. very small. It's paired with a 90 kilowatt electric motor and a 15.5 kilowatt hour battery. So you're looking at what they say is 285 plus horsepower and then torque is all the way up to 383. For a small torque. vehicle, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all electric range is about 30 miles. So that's you know, better than good. a lot. It's mm-hmm. getting there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, outside. for the size of for yeah. that size, yeah. which there's, there's not a lot, there's not a lot. Of, for the battery. Yeah. Or, and 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 what in, I mean, in that class, there aren't many plug-in hybrids. No, and most of them are uh, at 20 or less. The yeah. Ones that, I mean, the typical plug-in hybrid is standing around 24 or less. Yeah. yeah so, mm-hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. I mean, that's... Uh... Any uh, any other comments about the, the resurgence of the Hornet from anyone? Uh, I just like I, I'll just kind of repeat what I said. I when think is a, it supposed to be out? So I think we can expect the GT first this winter, and then the RT, so the plug-in one, is going to be early 2023 or like spring 2023. Okay, so. thank you, sir. It's very an, much. It's an attractive little. It, little it's. I think it's. A, I think it's a smart. Yeah, it looks yeah. good. It's a smart move by them. You know. I. Yeah. I said the same thing about the Dart, though. Again, was that the last new model? Uh, the God, Dodge it came might out be. With? Well, you know, it I last, like last Dart all new out. vehicle. And then, well, well, I think well, we the, all did it at the, the time. Thing, the, the thing going for this is it's a crossover. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is. It's kind of like a lifted dart, does it not? Kind of look like a lifted dart a little bit. You know, when the dart came out, there was a void for any of of any new interesting vehicles in that class. They had done some things to actually make it profitable that weren't obvious when you looked at it. It had decent handling. You know, it had a lot of manual transmission. You know, what also was interesting about it is that they had a program where you could have a registry for it like mm. if you would like you were getting married or having a baby you could actually have a registry <laughs> and people that, could yeah. buy like yeah. floor mats for you or, nice. yeah that was, that was a thing. that's pretty cool that actually yeah that's kind of smart yeah all those marketing now I'm people. done reminiscing <laughs> <laughs> all right let's move on to our lightning round where basically we'll just see what everybody thinks about this current automotive topic To cut down on flipping vehicles, General Motors is threatening to void warranties on the new Corvette Z06, Escalade V, and Hummer EV models if they are sold within 12 months of initial purchase. Do you think this will help stop high prices on used, quote-unquote, but hard-to-get vehicles? Interesting approach. They can't get the dealers to to walk the line, but they're going to try it with the customers. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it would stop I, me. <laughs> you know, but, but it's only it, if you knew. Yeah, yeah, that's because true. the seller ain't gonna care, right? No, like right. if I sold you a car, I'd be like, you didn't do your due diligence right. to yeah, figure out you. that your warranties are now all void yeah. on this brand new car. Right. It's not gonna mm. stop people from trying to sell it necessarily, right? It would. The idea is that there would be no market for it. Right. If yeah. the right. public was informed of this, then you would right. say, well, I'm not buying that because that voids the warranty. Right. And I have Therefore, to, you can't sell the car. So. Right. And I have to wonder if the people who are already going to go out and buy, like, you know, it's a hard to get vehicle. It's like a collector's piece. They're going to spend the extra money. And to them, the warranty, it's like, 
well, I'm not driving it. It's going to be hermetically sealed in a in a garage for five years, and then I'm going to sell it. You know, so I wonder if they'll really care. If you're paying That's a, a huge amount of money, sure, sure. And That's and good. there is another thing. There are all these aftermarket warranty companies that could basically you could buy an aftermarket warranty and and stick it on it, and mm -hmm. for probably. Let's With something say like these cars, though? Grand. Well, I'm just saying, I guarantee you there's some aftermarket warranty company yeah. out there that's willing to pay. Maybe. It all depends on what this vehicle will garner, yeah. how much money. But it would stop me because, you know, if you don't have a factory warranty on something that's brand new, no matter what other warranty you get, it's probably not going to be as good. Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. no, couldn't yeah. be. Not, these not, are all high, strong engines. Right. And Something you want to warrant. Uh, amazing yeah. electrical <laughs> interest infrastructure that you know, probably is probably going to have some issues. I mean, these are all like first model yeah. year for, yeah. for a lot of them. Yeah. So I, and we all know what that means. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so sick of like these, like having this keep come up. Like, how can we keep people from gouging everybody? Like, I'm just ready for this era to be over. Me too. Like, yeah. This is miserable. Yeah. It's yeah. All the time. We're talking about Nissan Zs with like oh $73,000 my God. Oh. Yep. markups. Yep. I mean, it's just like, it's just over the top and it just eventually has to end. Do you want to hear something uh, even worse? Like, so this is specifically for the Z06. And this kind of like came after this voiding of the warranty thing. And um, one dealership was selling the allocation. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. That was the markup. Was you could buy the you could allocation, get in line. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then they would sell to you at MSRP, right? Yeah. They would sell you a Z06 at MSRP, well, that's, but that's you paid twist, you paid seventy k for your allocation, for your right? So obviously that went viral, and people are like, "Are you have to be kidding me? You that's insanity! You're right. basically just profiting because you saw other people profiting, but turns out they were doing it for charity." Which I, should have been I made a little clearer. From but. <laughs> one, give me the info on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was at a, and I can't even remember. It was a dealership, and they had something high end on their floor, and they had this ridiculous price on it. And I'm not going to mention who it was, but it was like seventy grand over MSRP. Mm. They said, and it was sitting there on the car, how much it was, and they basically said, "We have no intentions of selling this car. It draws people in." Mm -hmm. We've put that on there so people will stop asking. Mm. They come to see mm. the car, they walk around it, they marvel, they buy something else. Right. It was a draw, and they said, we've only put it on there because, I said, if you were really an idiot and you wanted to give us that right. kind of money, we'd do it. But we know nobody in their right mind is going to do it. So I wonder how much that is affecting. That, sure. That's happening. Yeah. You know, people get one Hummer EV. And they want to basically for it to be the draw, you yeah. know, the the circus clown, whatever. It's just a weird time. It's, weird. it's a weird it time, folks. And even though people are doing it, our advice once again is if you don't have to buy a car right now, maybe you should wait. Okay, we have an email. An email, actually, from Jim Mayen. He's I've, a podcast. He, he listens to our podcast. Thank you, Jim, very much. Uh, I've noticed automakers addressing different horsepower ratings for regular unleaded gas and for premium. For example, Mazda 3 is 225 horsepower on regular and 250 with premium. Is this something new, having different horsepower ratings for different octane ratings? I'm picking up my base Bronco MT soon and planning on using regular unleaded, but is it really the case that I can go back and forth between regular and premium and experience different power levels without any consequences? Question mark. A lot there, Jim. <laughs> And our expert team is going to take a crack at it. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> Not that I didn't trust Jim, but I did want to go check. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I went on Mazda's press website, and uh, he, he's right. Two, it was 225 horsepower, 227, and 250. And that was the only engine. It was for the turbocharged mm -hmm. engine. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure which other automakers he's talking about. Ford I, does I it with the Bronco. Ford does it? It's an okay. additional 30. So it's you go from 270 to uh, 300, I think, yeah, with the four-cylinder. I don't think it's a usual yep. thing, but it clearly is a thing. But I'll, like... Two, we're talking 25 horsepower. Um, 
you're probably not going to notice a difference. And it's at the top <laughs> end. It's not like mm-hmm. torque. It's not going to like. It, I don't think it's going to be a noticeable thing. I mean, like you said, John, it's it's at the top. It, end. Yeah, it's at your it's at the top of your RPM range. Pat Goss used to harp on this a lot. He would say, "Look, you want that extra horsepower? You use the premium fuel, fine. But if the vehicle says." recommended premium so that you can get by on regular, you're going to give up that top end, but you'll probably never notice it. Right. Uh, I agree. If it's torque, it's going to be more noticeable than horsepower. But uh, I, Jim, frankly, yes, you can go back and forth. If the vehicle says recommended premium, you can go back and forth between regular and premium. If it says required premium, you cannot. Has anybody ever, can they ever remember a vehicle where they actually noticed the difference in power between regular and Not necessarily, but I do remember, only only because I've been trying to buy one of these for years, the Mustang SVO had a switch that you could go between regular and premium. It was on the dash. You would press that switch. Yeah, it's in our retro review if you want to check that out. Ah, And um, (laughs) yeah, so that switch is there. And I've done research on it. And I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Like some people are saying that when you change it, I mean, obviously the onboard computer is then adjusting things, right. but even like the boost would go up a little bit, up to like 15 well, PSI. Well, it's more and, sensitive on turbocharged yeah. engines than natural mm-hmm. aspirin. So, mm-hmm. uh, but your modern car, probably not going to have a switch. Ford loves the flight switches, but no, it's, they probably won't be about, in there. You know, you don't want it <laughs> but, to ping. Early computers could yeah. compensate for all that. Uh, read the owner's manual and it will keep you up to date. You'll know what to do. So, Jim, buy it, read the owner's manual, use mm-hmm. the type of gas it says you should, or flip back and forth if it says recommended, and enjoy it. Yeah, just yeah. use regular and tell everybody you're getting the high horsepower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Save the money. Yeah, yeah. True. Save the money. That'll be fine. Well, speaking of high horsepower, um, you know, because we're sort of inside the Beltway uh, on Motor Week, we hear lots of news from automakers before it gets out to the mass media. So, when... Stellantis announced that, you know, the Dodge uh, brand was going to stop making the, the big V8s. Mm. Uh, you know, it was like, OK, we it made all the made the nightly news and made all the newspapers and made, made just about everything. And we're thinking that's news because we had already heard it. However, they followed that. And we knew that they had been promising that just because you had you couldn't get the, the ice challenger and charger anymore. Uh, that they were going to do something with an EV that would basically knock everybody's socks off. And it looks like that's exactly what's happening. And, Greg, why don't you take us from there? Yeah, I'm putting my socks back on as we speak. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you knew it was going to happen. Uh, Eventually, Dodge had to go all electric, get rid of the the Hellcats engines. We saw that coming, like you said. Um, And so they come out with this. What are we talking about? Uh, a few days ago Hmm. and um, what they roll out with is a concept uh, known as the Charger Daytona so they're bringing back Daytona name Mm -hmm. Um, we saw it on another Charger but this concept is a two door um, so it's coupe styling again this is not the production version we don't know what it's going to be but at least appears to be a coupe at this point Um, so they they naturally rolled out what we would imagine would be the highest Mm-hmm. performing yeah. EV charger, and it's uh, going to be known as the Banshee. Uh, yeah. You just love Dodge's <laughs> marketing terms, Hellcat, Red Eye, Banshee. It's got like a demon. screaming sort of demon yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. character uh, yeah, actually, you know, on I it, too. It. Uh, Me, too. I <laughs> liked it. I liked it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that was a common I'll thing. I'll pick up 60s. with their laying yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this also this has all wheel drive. And John, you and I were talking about it a little bit. I thought it was a little odd that they would be putting all wheel drive in this muscle car for so long with the Charger and Challenger. They just got off on on making it like rear wheel drive, a lot of horsepower, not necessarily the best performing car, but just like a lot of fun, kind of mm. kind of wild. Uh, so going all wheel drive, I thought was was odd, but. As you kind of reminded me, they're probably going to be able to offer rear-wheel drive. Sure. Maybe. And this is, like I said, this is their ultimate performing um, charger. So um, 
it'll give them all the times that will make headlines of right. zero to 60. Mm -hmm. you've got things like multiple that. Multiple motors. And yeah, but if you um, likely, I would guess that they're going to offer rear wheel drive for lots of. It, if they want, I mean, this is still going to look like a, a Charger or a Challenger, you know, that at least the, 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 the concept does, you know, it's low, it's flat, it's long. Mm -hmm. And basically, they know that they've got a significant slice of the uh, police market. And not every yeah. police department wants to go to SUVs. Some of them still like cars. And they predominantly like rear-wheel drive uh, pursuit mm -hmm. cars. Yeah. Uh, so I can certainly see where they would basically do a two-wheel drive version with a decent-sized battery to get... Uh, to stay in that police market, because I don't think hardly anybody else is going to even dabble in cars for police work from here on. Probably not. But that's just my but, guess. Um, no, no inside knowledge. There. Yeah, we alluded to the styling a little bit. Um, they, I think they even went further with the nostalgia. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to it looks like the, the yeah. Dukes of Hazard revisit. <laughs> And they uh, they also bring back something that's uh, you know depending on how old you are how deep you get into Mopar but the Fretzog logo, mm. which was like unofficially their logo for a time uh, they would put it on muscle cars without really referencing it. It was it's weird because I even had to look it up because I wasn't super familiar with I know I had seen it before and and if you are unsure of what I'm talking about it's like a triangle that looks like three Eiffel towers right. like mm. butt to butt. Um, and then, like I said, it, it, it dates back to I, I don't exactly know where it came from, but I can remember seeing it on Chrysler products back in the early, in 63, 64, it's, somewhere well, in there. It coincided. Actually, this is through my research. I don't just uh. know this stuff. <laughs> uh, so it coincided with the space race. And ah, Chrysler was obviously okay. had their hands in getting they did. man to the moon. Yeah. Um, so it had a little bit to do with that. And then they didn't market it. They didn't talk about it. They just kind of put it put on it their there. muscle cars mm. for a time. Very and, good. And then they good put, piece of research. They put it in their bag. Yeah, uh, credit to Motor Trend. Um, I forget who wrote it, I'm, and I feel so bad. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, they pulled it out of their back pocket, and now it's it stands for their electric initiative. Huh. So if you see it, and I think it might be on the, does is it on the uh, the Hornet? Um. I don't think it's on the Hornet. There is a different badge on it, but I don't think it's that. It, uh, it, it might be. I'm I, I'm pretty sure it is. If not, anyway, this is the. If you see this yeah. symbol, it basically means electrification. Speaking, for yeah, or, speaking about yeah. retro, yeah, yeah. yeah so cool. so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so they didn't give us any official numbers or anything. Um, and uh, but you can assume it's going to be super fast. It's going to be more um, better performance than the Hellcat. And the two interesting things are um, the transmission. So mm -hmm. it's an all so it's all electric, but it will have a transmission. Back to the marketing terms, mm. erupt is the name yep. of the <laughs> transmission, uh, and it'll actually uh, you'll <coughs> excuse me, you'll have shift points, which you don't normally have. Uh, I have driven EVs with transmissions. Uh, there yeah, you did. There, yeah, yeah. Uh, the a a Genovation. Yeah, I drove yeah the, the Corvette. Corvette, which had the automatic. They also make a manual. Mm -hmm. um, and I drove an older one for another OTE that had a manual. Um, oh, yeah. And honestly, it's not as weird as you think it is. It's kind of like at first you're like, oh wow, that's that's not what I expected in an EV. But then you just drive it; it's normal. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Uh, but the industry first exhaust system, <laughs> yeah, uh, which technically I guess isn't an exhaust system, uh, but it is a an actual noise that is made and heard outside of the yeah. car yep. from air being sucked in, thrown into a chamber, all amplified and, and retuned <laughs> and blown out the back like a typical exhaust. exhaust. Mm -hmm. But it's solely for sound, and they tuned it to be 126 decibels. <laughs> which is which illegal is exact, in many places. Yeah. The exact <laughs> same as the Hellcat. Yeah. Ah. So there, okay. it's every bit as loud. Oh, and if you go online Lord, and find the video, you can actually hear it revving up. And it's, it's tuned with the throttle. Yeah. So, I mean, you yeah, hear yeah. it uh, like you were driving in ice. You know, that took some engineering team. Leave it to the uh, it's, But they, yeah, ha really but they had to. Yeah, How they could had you to. not? Yeah. Yeah. How I could mean, you that not? That was actually the big question when the word start, first started filtering out that there was going to be an EV on that, you know, on that platform. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you do it without the sound? And thank goodness it's not all electronically it's generated. Mi yeah. It's a mix of like old school yeah. and new school, mm -hmm. which yeah. I think is exactly what they're going for. I'd love to hear it in person. Uh, and I can't wait to drive it. I mean, I'm all for this. I, like, 
They, they got everything they could out of the Charger and Challenger. They had to move on. Do you realize and those chassis, that's the last so vestige old. of the Mercedes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. 20, 20 plus yeah. years yeah. old. But anyway, just throw power at us, make it rear wheel drive. Like, I, I'm buying every little piece of this. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can call it corny or kitsch, no, whatever you want to no, call no. it. I love it. So. Can't hey. wait to drive it. Um, we'll just we don't have any dates yet, and no. hopefully no. within the next two years. I think they were saying something about like 2024 or yeah. 2025 was when I'm, their first muscle I think car I saw was going to number. But e I, I would have to imagine if they're showing it to e us within the next two years. Yeah, we'll probably behind. And they'll behind and wheels. they'll keep it up. They'll they'll have drips and drabs. Of, I of I it. really hope it stays close to that concept design. Oh, okay. I hate seeing well, concepts these days because it's like when you finally see the production model, you get so disappointed. That's all Always, it's been the case for most of my career, but this this looks so sharp. But there yeah. isn't much about it that doesn't look production ready. True, no, you're absolutely opinion. right. Like it, yeah. yeah. Look, man, the final comment for me is like they knew the assignment and they executed. Yep. So I don't see like if if you're not into it, then you're just not into the whole Mopar thing, and that's fine. But yeah. like yeah. I, I just feel like they kind of they kind of hit it on the head here. Mm -hmm. Well done, well done. Yep. Anybody got a rant and rave this week before we wrap things up? I do. Oh, Unless you had okay. One. Here comes um, Jessica. I do, but oh, I want to hear yours. Mine. And okay. mine was just inspired. We, we should bring back the bell. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two. Two. The first person to hit it. Um, uh, it was inspired by something I saw this morning while I was driving. And it is stop making wide turns. Mm. You don't you mean need, turning left to go right? Yes. You don't need to do it. The, you're, if you, you uh, people need to maybe understand the dimensions of their vehicles first before <laughs> they get in them and start driving them. But I saw a woman today in a CRV making a, making a wide turn on a two lane road. Like Traffic could have passed her, and somebody could have very easily clipped her. And there was no, there was no reason for it. You are driving a consumer vehicle that you don't. It is completely unnecessary, pretty much on no matter what road that you're driving on. I I've never most, found that you have had to do it ever. No, I see it mostly though with people driving full size pickup trucks, and maybe they're not familiar with them. They just, you know, I see that a lot, yeah. but mm -hmm. it drives me crazy. But that's another yep. thing you need yeah. to understand the dimensions of your vehicle. And I think that's a big problem too with large, the larger the vehicle that we have on on the roads. Is like people do not understand truly where you are in a lane, and then making a turn is even more difficult. Uh, I have a confession. I'm a wide turn. <gasps> not that bad. I will say this. I don't do it that bad. I don't go left to go right unless I absolutely have to. But on the scale of turning, I tend to be wide, and I'll tell you why. It's because of this job. It's because we drive cars sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's my first time in it. Okay. And I don't want to scratch a wheel or curb it. Or right. I get that. That is why I, and like I said, I don't come out wide into another mm -hmm. lane, but if I'm in a shopping center, if I'm anywhere, I will take every little bit of space that I have because I do not want to damage. I don't car. think and that's bad. Car, if you have the awareness, then yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, so I, 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 I'll, I'll take the heat. I'll say I'm a wider <laughs> turner. Yeah, but that's, that's a little different. You're at a low speed situation with high curbs. Who hasn't in, in this room you know, scratched up more than their share of wheels? Oh, not and, me. <laughs> I certainly have around gas pumps and stuff like that because I was in a big vehicle unfamiliar mm -hmm. with it. But we're talking about... I on the road with something not even that large and you see these people drift over to one side to go mm -hmm, to the other mm -hmm. side and if they don't use a turn signal yeah they're completely caught by yep. surprise yep. by them yeah i don't like what you the first one of the first things they teach you in driver's ed is when you're pulling into a road after a stop sign if it's a two lane you know double lane road going in the, the direction you're going pull into the nearest lane yep do the shortest oh, turn yeah. you can to get into yeah. the nearest lane. And so many people do just the opposite. They pull into the farthest lane. Yep. Uh, it's okay to get there eventually, but you don't know there could be somebody coming up in that lane, turning out of another street. Yeah, how many times have you been turning? Yeah. Like from a light, right. and then you, somebody is merging into it, Correct. and they merge very wide, and you have to honk at them because you're like, "Hi, I have the right of way. You right. do not." 
Yeah. yeah. And then they look at you. I yeah, then they're like, what? <laughs> what? you're driving so bad. I, like, you, I don't honked. think anybody knows what right away means anymore. Side note, I bet you I've honked in all of my years of driving, honked on the road less than 10 times. Really? I, bet, I would bet money that I've done that. I'm not a honker. Yeah. Have you ever I'm met somebody who is a honker and oh, you get in their car yeah. and their horn honker. is like, I mean, their horn is like, dude, like, like, sounds so weird? <laughs> like, oh man, whatever. I, 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 no, we're going to stop it here. All right. All right. For a long time. <laughs> Alex, what do you got? I'll keep it really brief. Uh, it's, well, don't worry about that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's a rant that I'm sure has been done before and will be done many times in the future. Uh, it's 2022. Cars are getting really expensive. Mm. They spend all this money to make these beautiful displays with great user interfaces and all that. You put the car in reverse, and the image is like a PowerPoint. It's like 480p. Oh, yeah, it, it, I could I, agree I with that. I don't like the low the backup res. Cam, is that yeah, backup cam yeah, the reverse is like camera. Poor resolution. It's poor resolution in the dark. It it doesn't really show you anything. It won't point any fingers. Really? But we've had some cars recently that are on the you know the there's upscale. There's a scale and, there too. Yeah. I feel like some yeah. are better than and, others. And I'm I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure you know, cheap, like they cheap. can they can, well, well yeah. You know yeah, what's <laughs> interesting about that? And I have to go double check at this point. I'm pretty sure Ford just sent an over the air update to something and it and it helped that like it made the picture clearer now mm. i have no idea what that entailed mm. but i do remember hearing something about that um Interesting. and it might have had mm, i can't remember you know, but we're yeah we're so dependent on these cameras now that uh, you know anything they need to be as clear as possible mm -hmm. and there's really mm. no excuse for them not to be clear right. not at this point no yeah. And in higher end models, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, I can kind of understand it in the lower end. If I'm paying level, 50k for a car, yeah. it better be pretty decent resolution. Yeah. Back. The one I'm thinking of, the MSRP was over 100k. Whoa! So, yeah. Okay. Again, not going to point any fingers, okay. but there's a reason. I want to narrow the. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was recent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can all see clearer now. Thank <laughs> you, Alex. Okay, we want to thank everybody for listening to our podcast, number 285 from Motor Week. Thanks to our audio engineer, David Wainwright, who basically makes us always sound better than we have any right to be. Our <laughs> podcast producer, Jessica Ray. Mm. Our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. And to all of you out there, if you want more Motor Week, hop on over to our website, motorweek.org. If you're looking for the public television station that carries us, pull down the menu up there about the show, put in your zip code. You'll get all of the uh, newest up-to-date times and locales on your dial for us. If you're a cable person, uh, we hope you have Mav TV on your cable. Go to MavTV.com. They list us. Uh, we're on quite a few times a week with them. You should probably mention when the season 42 begins airing. What's the date? The season 42 airing begins with the second weekend in September. So that's and September on 10th. TV, oh. the September 10th. And we're about, uh, I think it's Two, eight days ten. later, nine days later on MAV TV. Something anyway, it's like the that. Monday a week later, mm, I believe. Mm. Anyway, all of that is available, our information to point you in the right direction on our website. Of course, you can stream us on multiple sources at pbs.org slash motorweek. You can watch the latest episodes and at youtube.com slash motorweek. All of our latest features, road tests, and stuff going back many, many years, including Ben Davis's retro road test. Oh, if yeah. you've got a screen, you can watch Motor Week. And we hope you'll join us again for our next podcast. Till next time, I'm John Davis. Thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Lucas Oil, TireRack.com, and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.